Um, first of all, my thanks to uh, Vincenti, Ramon, and, and to you for uh, inviting me here, and uh, Vincenti for translating uh, much of the paper into Spanish. As you can tell, uh, I am a typical Brit. I have next to no foreign language ability, so my presentation uh, will be in English. Uh, please uh, raise your hand or throw something at me, preferably money, if I'm going uh, too fast, uh, and I'll try and slow down and repeat what I'm, I'm saying. Uh, also, a warning for those of a, a nervous disposition, this presentation and paper does involve some swearing, some a harsh language. Uh, I'm quoting people. It's not me using these offensive terms. It, it's for some of the people I'll be uh, discussing. So if you feel you might be offended by the odd uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, swear word, um, I'll try and give some trigger warnings so you can cover your ears uh, if you feel it's necessary. Um, so uh, uh, I'll try to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes uh, and then take questions, I hope, or engage in uh, some sort of uh, discussion. Uh, what I'm talking about uh, is largely from a UK-based uh, uh, account of what's going on in the United Kingdom. But I draw on a few examples from over... Uh, uh, from other countries as well, but my concentration in this talk has been on UK-based movements and a UK-based phenomenon. Uh, in the UK in recent years, there's been a modest resurgence of interest in anarchism, both within the activist communities and within academia. Uh, in the UK, there's now a specialist group of the Political Studies Association, uh, which is dedicated to the study of anarchism, just as there has been long-standing ones for Marxism, conservatism, liberalism, uh, uh, and even the Liberal Democrats. Uh, uh, now, sometimes some of these discussions in academia to perhaps satisfy timid uh, management or to try and ingratiate yourselves with conservative-minded funding bodies. They might not use the term anarchist, but uh, alternative governance models, radical uh, 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 reimaginings of democracy uh, might use these sorts of terms, but they're often talking about uh, anarchist movements or anarchist thinkers or anarchist perspectives. Uh, and that might be one of the reasons why I talk about, in this paper, uh, democracy uh, um, to uh, suggest that anarchism is not anti-democratic uh, in the sense that they uh, uh, include the people, it comes from the, the people, even if they are anti-democratic in the sense of being anti-state forms of democracy. Uh, hence, the, I better be careful, I don't press the wrong button here and deny women some basic uh, rights. Um, so there's uh, little academic uh, research, because uh, in the UK there's been only modest and quite recent engagement with uh, anarchism, uh, and indeed up until about the early 1990s, if you wrote about anarchism in the UK within certain disciplines, they more or less thought you were talking about right-wing libertarians, uh, anarcho-capitalists, people who followed people like Robert Nozick or Murray Rothbard. Um, such was the bias uh, and the sort of general conservative attitude within uh, mainstream academia. There has, within this context, been little academic research on anti-electoralism, 
Uh, Carol Gallus, in one of her papers, uh, makes this point that there is, uh, both historically and contemporarily, literally a research on anti-electoral uh, movements, both historically and their impact. So although there are sort of anti-electoral movements, say, around uh, uh, May 1968 in France, the impact of these movements, uh, what impact these campaigns actually had on electoral turnout has not actually been systematically studied. And there's been even less as a result uh, study of anarchist engagements with constitutionalism, of anarchists participating in elections, in state elections or quasi-state elections. So that was my entry into the topic. Uh, my interest in it is because although I come from England, I've lived for the last 15 years in Scotland. And you may be aware that last uh, September there was a, referenda, a referendum on Scottish independence. Should Scotland become independent from the rest of the United Kingdom? And it was a much closer run event than uh, commentators originally predicted. It was assumed that the no vote would be overwhelming. In the end, the margin was little more than 10%, uh, 45 to 55%. And since then, the traffic has been almost entirely with the independence movement. So if there was to be a referendum held uh, now, the independence campaign would stand a pretty good chance of winning. And because of this independence debate, the anarchists, both in Scotland and in England, were debating to the degree to which they should participate in the referendum. Should they come out supporting a smaller Scottish state over a United Kingdom state? Or are they just both states and both to be rejected? And there's a genuine sort of debate with some being very active in the referendum campaign, not because they supported one state form necessarily over the other, but by engaging in the debate, they could raise questions about the state itself, raise questions which the initial referendum question excluded. What the mainstream parties, which either supported independence or rejected independence, weren't uh, uh, were marginalising or not even discussing as part of the independence debate, as in the role of uh, international, how can you be independent in a world of international capitalism? How can you claim to still be independent if the independent state, the SNP, Scottish National Party, wanted, was still to be part of NATO, was still to be part of the World Trade Organisation, was still to be part of the European Union? In what sense... Are you an independent state if you're still tied into the same neoliberal economic global framework? And by participating in this campaign, what was known as the yes but campaign, as it were, uh, they could raise these questions and uh, encourage more radical thinking on the very forms of uh, polity we want to uh, 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 develop. Now, because there was so little, uh, certainly in uh, English, but maybe a, a substantial body of work in other languages, uh, but in English, there was uh, very little um, substantive uh, uh, writing on anarchist engagements with constitutionalism. Uh, I had to do something I hadn't done for 15 years. Uh, I'm a theorist. I read books and articles and sit staring out the window and then write a bit and then stare out the window again and then try and read more. I had to do something different. I had to go out and interview people again. So I interviewed uh, an Israeli uh, anarchist who'd been involved in elections, a libertarian communist uh, in Israel. Uh, they all gave me permission to cite their names, uh, Ilan Sharif. Uh, I interviewed one of the anarchists who'd been involved in the referendum campaign and indeed interviewed uh, Noam Chomsky, 
I don't know if you uh, know him, Chomsky, uh, who came out in support of the Scottish referenda and uh, independence in the Scottish re referenda, so he's supporting Scottish independence. And that got picked up by some of the Scottish newspapers. The Chomsky, so such a notable figure as Chomsky had taken a, a, a position on, on it, uh, a bloke called Gordon Asher. And as I was getting into this, Class War, an uh, anarchist group in Britain, announced it was going to stand 29 candidates in next month's election. Uh, we've got elections too in, uh, in May. Uh, and that kind of uh, uh, you know, re uh, rekindled my enthusiasm for the topic, and I interviewed one of the candidates who's... Uh, standing for class war. Now, they announced 29 candidates. I think only nine of them got their papers and their deposits and the signatories together. So I think only nine uh, candidates are standing in 651 constituencies. But nevertheless, it's an interesting phenomena that they are dedicating resources, quite considerable resources for such a small organisation, to participation in elections. So I wanted to explore this phenomena of anarchist constitutionalism, especially when the default position of anarchism is anti-constitutionalist and indeed has been defined for, uh, you know, for in the UK since the 1880s by their stance against participating in parliamentary elections. So the very one of the very first anarchist newspapers in Britain... Um, wasn't actually in English, it was in Yiddish, called the Arbiter Frent. It was based in the Jewish immigrant community, uh, the uh, workers' friend. And it was a split from the Polish Yiddel, a uh, sort of uh, Yiddish socialist newspaper. Uh, and it split because the Polish Yiddel started to support parliamentary candidates. And this was considered uh, unacceptable, and they set up this rival newspaper, which later uh, overtly gained an anarchist uh, subheading. And so the aims of this presentation are many fold. Uh, they're to describe two different versions of democracy uh, liberal democracy, democracy one, based on state politics, our standard account of politics, our standard account of democracy, and a prefigurative account of democracy. Uh, based on anti-state politics, a different interpretation of the notion politics. So I'm going to explain uh, pre, uh, these two different accounts, liberal democracy and prefigurative democracy. I'm then going to explain the prefigurative democratic criticisms of democracy, the standard criticisms coming from... Uh, these radicals of democracy. I should make it clear, I am not going to be explaining whether they are right or wrong. I'm simply going to be saying what their criticisms are because then I'm going to identify the phenomena of prefigurative engagement in liberal democracy where these uh, radicals who have this different account of democracy coming from an anti-state perspective start engaging with liberal democracy. Is start standing in elections or engaging in referenda. So I'm going to identify that phenomena and then see whether or not these engagements avoid the very criticisms they make in criticism two, in point two. Do they avoid the very criticisms they raise against liberal democracy when they participate in it? And if they don't, if they do, how do they do it? And if they don't, what is their justification for uh, uh, ignoring their own criticisms of uh, formal democratic state structures? So uh, when I first got involved in the study of politics, and I have to explain, I hold my hand up here, uh, I teach in the Department of Politics. I've been teaching politics uh, at degree level for uh, nearly 20 years and I don't have a politics degree. In fact, I've never studied politics. Uh, I come from a philosophy background. I did all my degrees in uh, philosophy, my undergrad, my postgraduate masters, my PhD are all in philosophy or critical theory. 
So I've never actually, so I'm a bit of a fraud. Uh, but when I um, engage with uh, politics, um, the accounts you're given, and indeed many of the introductory textbooks on it, talk about politics being involved with uh, engagement with the state, winning control of the state, using the state, the efficiency of the state, the representativeness of the state, the stability of the state. Politics is geared toward around the operations of the state and largely, although this has changed in, a couple, uh, in recent years, international relations is still around the state or quasi-state institutions. And that tends to be the way politics is represented, certainly in the media in the UK. So when they have formal politics programmes on in the UK, it's politicians they're talking about. People who are either at the state level, fighting to be at the state level, or important figures in the quasi-state, the local state, part of the uh, state structure. Those who have had powers handed down to them by the state to work at the local level. And indeed, one of the standard criticisms of anarchists from orthodox Marxists is that anarchists are apolitical because they don't engage with the state. Because they're against the state, they won't engage with the state, therefore they're no longer political. So it's a, it's a, uh, a counter politics isn't just taken from the sort of mainstream, but you can find it in Lenin, in Plenikov, in Stalin. But of course we're well aware that politics is much wider than this. Well, the media in the UK, and I can't speak about the Spanish example, uh, maybe they have a broader remit given the uh, local uh, recent events, but by and large, we are well aware that politics is much wider than this. We can talk about uh, the politics of everyday life. How the politics of changing other people's realities, of resource allocation, of decision making, of identity construction, which takes out place outside and beyond the state. We've got a wider notion. As academics, we're well aware that politics doesn't just happen uh, outside and within the state. And this is a count which is found in heterodox Marxism, feminisms, ecologisms. Think of a famous feminist slogan, the personal is political. How we deal with one another is a political issue. How texts represent us is a political issue, as it imposes particular identities or forms of discourse, identification on us, and dictate the way our social practices operate. That's a form of politics too. So we can talk about the politics of film, the politics of television, the politics of architecture. And what we tend to find is though we have this wider account of politics, nevertheless, there's a constant effort to reshape this wider, more diverse account of politics back into the state form. So when we get to issues around you know, uh, uh, personal discourses, uh, uh, actions outside and beyond the state as we become involved in other forms of uh, resource allocation. We can ask, you know, does the state approve of this? Does the state legitimise it? Can the state learn from this? How can it be used to maintain the state? What sort of constituencies will this build for new parties or maintain existing parties? And politics too, there's this constant effort to recapture the wider notion of politics, to reframe it back into politics one. And so similarly, we have different counts of democracy. I won't go through it. I mean, this is standard, you no, know, politics 101, account of democracy. Uh, democracy based on the individual rights owning citizen coming from uh, Locke. Uh, and it's conceptually you know, connected to capitalism. It's about being unified into a single protective body, the state, and by being joined together, we constitute the demos. It's this unification of disparate, maybe competing interests, into one unified body which constitutes the demos, and the operating rules for this is democracy. 
with it, sing, you know, one person, one vote, uh, um, access to stand for office, members of the uh, elected officials being answerable to law, uh, universal freedoms of expression, of conscience, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and assembly, which ground democracy and enable the construction of the demos. When these principles come into conflict, the state is the arbiter which decides how those principles should be ordered in order to maintain the functioning of the state to be able to unify the disparate interests. What we get in prefigurative democracy, democracy two, is a different account. It's about multiple agents. Uh, involved in different material practices. Some maybe say squatters, others guerrilla gardeners, others involved in uh, welfare rights activities, disability rights activities, environmental campaigns. And they have different identities uh, and take part in different practices and different occasions. And no institution takes priority. They intersect with each other, but the discourses around networks of intersecting bodies of uh, radical activity, involving activity, uh, participatory activity, accessible activity, which challenges hierarchies. Hierarchies such as those based on democracy one. And although no institution takes universal priority, some institutions are obviously going to be more important on certain occasions. So on some occasions, labour activism is going to take precedence over the period of uh, a mass strike, for instance. So in 1984-85, in Britain, there's a very large uh, and devastating uh, strike, the miners' strike, uh, and this involved all forms of lots of different agents were supporting the miners, but in the coal mining communities, the strike activity uh, was one of the major ones. That's not to say there weren't other forms of activity there, but in that particular context, in that particular occasion, it uh, took sort of, uh, uh, sort of more important priority, rather than maybe some ecological campaign which had been running in that community at the same time. That's not to say the ecology campaign is unimportant or should be shelved, but you can understand why people were more dedicated to uh, a large-scale industrial uh, uh, activity which had the full power of the state rage against it uh, uh, on those occasions. So on some occasions, some groups are going to take being a uh, more significant position than others, but it's non-universal. It's not universal. You know, outside of mining communities, you know, other campaigns might be more important, and rightly so. And Democracy 1 provides the apparatus for trying to recuperate Democracy 2 back into the state form. So when you get these uh, radical activities, the strike raves, the occupations, the widespread environmental campaigns, there's an effort to try and recapture this into the state form, find a voice for it through the state. So democracy one, you now you find the raid and to uh, recast this into uh, engagement back into the state form. Now, prefigurative politics, my paper, I'm not going to go into much detail. Pre I try and explore the notion of prefiguration a little because it has become a much more widely uh, used term, certainly in the Anglophone world over the last 10 years. Uh, but it should be pointed out that prefigurative politics is not unique to the radical left to the anti-parliamentary or anti-hierarchical left. You can find reactionary forms of prefigurative action. Here's some. Here's a shop which doesn't like homeless people sleeping outside their shop. It puts customers off. doesn't attract the right sort of clientele. Well, 
They could campaign to get a councillor elected who will enact local bylaws to get vagrants off the street. Or you can just put studs down to so that they can't sleep there. Make the homeless, life, uh, homeless person's life that little bit more miserable. Uh, or uh, racists uh, use direct action. You don't want immigrants living in your community. You could campaign for a racist party, which will prohibit the movement of people whose skin hue you don't appreciate and do it through the parliamentary means. Or you can go out and attack people whose uh, uh, skin hue you don't like uh, to dissuade them from living in your community. It's a form of direct action, not a form of direct action most pre uh, people who propose uh, prefigurative politics support because most forms of prefiguration are based on key principles that of being against hierarchy, contesting hierarchy, some therefore uh, fluid notions of equality, a uh, social view of the self, a belief in social solidarity, and none of those examples would fit those criteria. So by prefigurative politics, we largely mean those politics which prefigure the principles of social anarchism. And here's an example, uh, not terribly well lit, of just that. Now, these activists could have campaigned to have the homeless spikes removed, get local councillors to pass local bylaws to outlaw uh, homeless spikes, uh, get the police to remove them, or they could do what they did, just put cement over them, smooth them down, make a nice shelf and bed back for the homeless person and uh, who needs at least some uh, minor respite. Prefigurative uh, practices are found in material social practices. They are material forms. Um, and they are often but not always confrontational. They're against dominant norms and structures. They're against uh, uh, the normal principles of capitalism, the state, discrimination, and about generating social goods through mutual aid and solidarity. And because they take different material forms, they involve different types of agency, different types of identity. Are you a protester, a squatter, a guerrilla gardener, a peace activist, a labour activist? And in different contexts, you have different identities, which are not reducible to a single identity. There's no master identity. And these activities are not discrete. They interlink with each other. People involved in direct action in one area and prefigurative practice in one area, often involved in prefigurative practices elsewhere. So anti squat um, um, uh, squatters movements, anti-homelessness movements, uh, personnel might well be also involved in environmental campaigns or labour campaigns. Labour activists may be involved in peace campaigns. But there's no central coordination. No one's saying, well, you know what, as you're involved in this movement, you should now be involved in that movement as well. You find your uh, own way through these different networks of uh, support and solidarity. And they may, their claims are much more modest. There is no universal authority. Unlike in democratic politics, there is one ultimate voice, the voice of the democratic state, the voice of the legislature. Uh, here there is no universal authority. Though there can still be expertise and leadership, this is contextual. Now, you can be a leader if you're involved in, say, an environmental campaign, which involves, say, stopping... Uh, um, we've got a problem in the UK around fracking. I don't know if you've heard about this. Uh, I, um, uh, and some of that might involve forms of direct action, locking on or squatting in trees or high buildings. Well, certain people have more skills in that sort of thing, expertise in that. So you're going to take their advice. If they've done it before... 
know, scaling a high building safely, you want to be following someone who knows what they're doing, so you're going to be following their leadership in so doing. But it doesn't mean you'll be following their leadership in every decision involved in the camp's activities, because their expertise is contextual to where they can demonstrate uh, expertise. And these prefigurative actions are embodied in the concept of direct action. You're trying to bring about in minutiae your eventual goals. You're prefiguring your goals in your activities. You're doing it directly. It's unmediated. It's non-representational. You're not trying to get, you're not trying to stand up for, I mean, you might be standing up for somebody else, but you're doing it for your own behalf too. You're not claiming that your action is right for, on behalf of others. You're also speaking for yourself. And that's not to say you're disinterested in others or uninterested in others, but there is responsibility on you that, it's, uh, that you're doing it, partly because you are going to be a beneficiary too. And you're not claiming it on behalf of some uh, abstract universal other. Now, the standard account uh, of anarchism is that it's anti-representative democracy. Some of our most standard accounts, certainly in the UK, of anarchism is that it's not, it's standard steadfastly against representative democracy uh, and that it advocates a full abstentionist position. Don't vote, spoil your ballots, don't stand, don't participate. Um, and here's a few examples of this. Uh, there's been the Anti-Elections Alliance, the Anti-Parliamentary Communist Federation, and now angry, not apathetic. However, as Spanish people know uh, only too well, the situation is actually much more, historically, much more complicated than that. Anarchists, historically and contemporarily, for instance, have preferred liberal democracy to authoritarian governments. Bakunin talked uh, admiringly of liberal democracies as opposed to authoritarian governments and we have been aware that anarchists have entered and supported liberal democracies in the face of uh, greater tyrannies. So we are and indeed anarchists will support social democratic reforms over neoliberalism. So you get Chomsky talking about trying to protect the welfare state against greater Republican cutbacks or even Democratic cutbacks. And we have a long, albeit minority, history of anarchist participation in elections. Not Spain, again, is a good example, but let's face it, Proudhon, the very first anarchist, was an elected member of the French Assembly. So the central question here is, is it necessarily inconsistent for anarchists to engage in constitutionalism? And what are the benefits and weaknesses of such anarchist electoral engagement? Well, here's a list of just some of the engagements of anarchists in uh, constitutionalism um, I've managed to discover in the UK uh, over the last sort of 40 years. And I include the Irish Republic at the bottom. They're not part of the UK. So, um, although they have close links with the anarchists in the UK. Similarly, you can find lots of examples elsewhere. The provosts and Caboteurs who run uh, uh, elected positions in Holland. Members of the Australian Anarchist Media Institute uh, have stood for election, including to the uh, Australian Senate. Those fans of punk music might remember Yellow Biafra of the Dead Kennedys, and he stood for mayor of San Francisco, uh, self identifying anarchist, and uh, Israeli uh, anti authoritarian communists have stood candidates or supported candidates on various occasions. One such uh, was to stand a candidate, uh, Rami Levine, who was imprisoned and for meeting with a Palestinian from the occupied territory, something which was illegal, uh, and was put in prison and they, by standing for election. One of the motives for that was if elected, parliamentary immunity would kick in and he'd be freed from prison. A pretty good reason for standing someone in an election, perhaps. 
Well, the anarchist criticisms of representative democracy, well, I'll rush through them because I'm sure you're pretty familiar with most of them. Uh, but largely that democracy reconstitutes or constitutes social hierarchies. It produces and maintains a class of leaders and social institutions that perpetuates or creates social economic uh, hierarchies. So this is one of the criticisms of Bakunin makes very early on, that even if you elect a radical candidate from a working class background, because they're involved in managerial decisions in a managerial atmosphere uh, under managerial conditions. They just become enculturated into that and they are just managers. They take on a different class role. And so you get criticisms of groups like Saritza from the anarchists. Uh, well, I, li I like this quote, so I'm going to use it. Um, uh, from... Um, one of my interviewees, uh, John Bigger, the class war candidate, who dismissed Siritsa as the bloke block, as opposed to the black block. The bloke block are just part of the same social networks of politicos, part of the same uh, mainstream uh, set of institutions and backgrounds uh, who negotiate amongst themselves and with others in power and make decisions on behalf of others. They're just part of the bloke block, bloke just meaning... Uh, chap or gentleman, uh, for those not unfamiliar with the term, as opposed to the black block, the sort of direct actionists. So it makes a contrast between the bloke block and the black block. And the participating in elections decreases the power of the, de of the demoi and reduces them back to this uh, demos. When you participate in elections, you're diminishing opportunities to develop self-management. You're electing someone to manage you, to take on the decisions which you could be participating in, to create institutions which take uh, a hierarchical position, who won't, can't and won't share information with you, which limits your self-development. And of course, you're participating in something which has, by its nature, a national identity. You participate as members of a particular polis, a particular state. Your electors electing, and that's the role you play. So it creates and maintains a national identity. The real power doesn't lie in Parliament. You get variations on this. Here's a cartoon from the Hereford Heckler just showing the government doing whatever the banking system asks rather people starve. Uh, I'm sure... Uh, 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 cartoon which has no resonance here in Spain. Um, uh, but real power doesn't lie in uh, par Parliament. Real power either lies e at the point of production or a wider view of the economy that production takes place in all aspects of our social life. No, through domestic labour, effective labour, enclosure, uh, it's still an economic account but it doesn't lie at the political level, it lies at the economic level, but the economic level is much more diverse. Or that there are other forms of oppression which don't start, initiate with the uh, state, things like patriarchy perhaps, which aren't reducible to the economic. The homophobia, perhaps. Uh, and then again, so fighting it through the state isn't going to have major impact on the maintenance of those uh, structures of domination. And even if some oppressions do derive from the state, they cannot be overcome by engaging with the state because all you're doing is recreating centralised power and centralised power creates these identities of subservience and control. The third main criticism is that constitutionalism doesn't work. That the track record of a bloke block, whether through Leninism or social democracy, is poor. No, uh, no, of all the gradualist attempts to bring in a radical transformation of society, none of them have come to fruition over 120 years of trying. And some of them have ended up in pretty appalling uh, 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 types of regime. And that the democratic process where it once challenged capital... You know, capitalism was 
at first frightened of democracy, it would give a voice to the masses, the masses would outnumber them, they'd vote away their property. Now capitalism has integrated democracy. It's got the structures in place to ensure that parliament uh, is uh, symbiotic uh, with the interests of capital. And that they're better alternatives. The black block of the Demoy rather than the bloke block of the Demos. That direct action gets the goods. A preference for uh, participatory uh, self-activity. Uh, and what's interesting is that these forms of direct action problematize the question of what it means to be successful. Raise the question, what, what do we mean by a successful politics? Well, we can understand that really easily with liberal democracy. Now, how big is your party membership? How successful are you at elections? How efficiently can you bring through your uh, policy uh, proposals uh, and their implementation? How well can you maintain the stability of the state? These are not the criteria for participatory uh, prefigurative democracy. They're more experimental, uh, uh, more experiential, more about the immediate experience. Are they enriching? Are they fun? Are they fulfilling? Are they mutually sustainable? Are they generating social goods like solidarity, uh, amiability, integrity, honesty, bravery? Do they even encourage the, uh, uh, the production of other prefigurative practices? Well, anarchist uh, position standardly, therefore, is anti-electoralism. Not to vote, to encourage voter abstention or uh, spoiled ba ballot campaigns. And that is still the main response, even by those who engage in anarchist constitutionalism. So all those people on one of the slides I showed who participate in anarchist electoralism are also, at the same time, encouraged non-participation in elections or have done in the past. And there are problems, however, with anti-electoralism. First of all, Anti-constitutionalism does not equate, does not equal, is not synonymous for, with support for radical action. And indeed, encouraging people to be passive at elections, argues Ian Bone, one of the proponents of anarchist electoralism. Uh, he was going to be one of the candidates, but was too ill to stand, I think. Um, might actually encourage greater passivity to those in power. I'm not going to bother to vote, but I'm still going to obey what they say. They know better than me. So it's right that I don't vote. And that way I don't have to take any responsibility. I'll just be a good order follower. So it might encourage people just to identify with their role as the good citizen with the uh, demos. There's little evidence that these anti-electoral campaigns have ever been successful, that they actually do decrease participation in elections or increase engagement in direct action. And indeed, some anti-constitutionalism might actually aid constitutional activity. How don't vote campaigns can become transmogrified into don't vote for them, but vote for us. Or by engaging in radical protest, you reawaken perhaps apathetic people who are aware of their civic responsibilities and in reawakening them of their civic responsibilities, they start to participate in elections more. So it redirects it back into democratic participation. Now, what's significant is that uh, anarchist constitutionalism doesn't ignore or reject these four criticisms, but use them to structure their engagement. Uh, my account here is based on Ellen Bogard's electoral guerrilla theatre. Now, Bogard uh, draws a distinction between soft satire in uh, um, candidacy, in which joke candidates send up the system by pranksterism. 
but they do so in such a way that anyone can laugh. It has no underlying political critique. It's just about having a good laugh. So in the UK, the most significant one of these was a bloke called Screaming Lord Such and his official monster raving loony party. I'm loony, me, and he'd be there with ridiculous uh, outfits to enliven and raise a smile during election nights amongst all the sort of po-faced politicians. He was fun, but he was making no social critique. He wasn't encouraging uh, general questioning of the relationship between uh, the citizen and the state and proposing new forms of uh, social relationship and economy. And you get other such parties as Rhinoceros Party in Canada. Uh, party in Canada. There's a uh, similar uh, joke party in uh, the 26 counties of the Republic of Ireland. So that's soft satire. Then there are those candidates who involve, engaged in radical uh, ridicule, part of a substan uh, of substantive ideological or real sociological difference. So they're trying to raise substantive major political and social concerns through their joke candidacy. So here, Michael, that should be fic Ficus, not Fictus, Michael Moore's Ficus 2000 uh, campaign, where he stood a pot plant against... Uh, incumbent Conservative Republican candidates who weren't facing opposition. Standard pop plant. A pop plant isn't a race of air, as in a part of his campaign, or the caboteurs in Holland. So there's a general political radical critique going on. And you can subdivide, this is my contribution, you can subdivide uh, Bogod's radical ridicule further into democratic interventions like Michael Moore's Ficus campaign, I've spelt it correctly there, or Pauline Pounce Down Australian campaign. It was, uh, she was a uh, uh, transvestite rather than transsexual, a transvestite candidate who, through their candidacy and camp uh, manoeuvres, satirised the far-right Ron Nation Party and Pauline Hanson, their leader, in order to be, create a more inclusive democratic process. So there, it's about improving democracy. Michael Moore isn't trying to overthrow democracy, he's trying to improve it, make it more uh, accountable, more inclusive. Same with Pauline uh, Pants down. Democratic or anarchist constitutionalist radical ridicule is prefigurative, critical, and undermines hierarchical state institutions. It's not about reforming state institutions, it's about undermining them in favour of different types of social relations. And it uses the alienation technique. It deliberately draws attention to the unacknowledged hierarchical and elitist features of constitutional democracy through their democratic endeavours. So part of your, the main function of your candidacy is to draw attention to the very problem of being a candidate itself. So you find these as part of, for instance, class wars or chalets or uh, the yes but engagement in the Scottish referendum. Uh, you try and draw attention to the power structures of representative democracy, formal and informal, uh, through your candidacies, through your electoral uh, activities. So you're trying to draw attention to the fact that all the major political parties are identical. They're all operating for, uh, within the neoliberal framework. They're all part of the same political network. And so here's the swearing, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, of your ears. Uh, there's the main party leaders there, all given the same title. They're all fucking wankers. And uh, each one is labelled that. They make even individual posters. And they engage them. They are all identical fucking wankers. They all uh, carry the same title. Uh, this banner was seized by the police. Um, there's now a campaign to get the banner back. Uh, and so you get also the account of how engaging in elections might reduce your role to that of a passive citizen in, as part of their electoral pitch. They also draw attention to the major sites of power outside of Parliament. So here's Ian Bone. We live in a feudal society dominated by an oligarchy of privately and Oxbridge-educated toffs who are not just for government banks and diplomacy but the media, music and comedy and even the opposition. So it's an intersecting network of power 
of which Parliament is just one part. Taking control of Parliament isn't going to do any much different. Our social system, is, uh, uh, our structure is rigged in favour of those with the most power, money and resources. This is from Lisa McKenzie, who's another class war candidate. She's a, a working class academic a researcher at the LSE and standing for class war. And she's actually gained quite a bit of media attention uh, because of her unusual background and her engagement in this uh, tactic. And it's given her a chance to, in national newspapers and national radio, uh, raise these criticisms of uh, the power structures. They point out the ineffectiveness of structural reforms and that they're not looking to uh, replace them. They're not looking to become uh, the new class of businessmen. The solution isn't voting. The solution is, to, and playing on the name of the group, class war. The solution isn't going to come through voting, it's by engaging and uh, opposing economic and social hierarchies. One thing we're not doing is setting ourselves up as a serious party that is going to take power. That's not what they're trying to do. They're not after claiming, they're claiming not uh, trying to take power. There is, however, problems. Because some of the candidates do seem to be structurally reformist do seem to be presenting themselves as offering a set of proposals which will make the lives of electors better if only we were elected. So you get Adam Clifford saying our policies include doubling benefit and pensions to be paid for by 50% uh, council tax. Ian Bone talking about these policy proposals and how they'll be funded and how much fairer they are. You'll get a better class of manager if we are elected. We are going to be a working class voice in Westminster. They are there. So it looks as though they are going to be participating. But electing the right people can make a difference. It is simply a matter of electing the right people with the right policies and the right character. So that seems to be in conflict with their other messages. Elsewhere, though, other candidates... Other in, others involved in prefigurative, uh, democratic engagements. Uh, again, make it clear that it's not through Parliament we're going to make change, that the best way to bring about change is through direct action, that they promote prefigurative action. We in no way see the election as an alternative to direct action. And uh, John Bigger goes on, I did a longer interview, and he reacts most lyrical, not about his electoral campaigning, but his engagement in direct action around uh, uh, um, housing, housing being a, a serious issue in uh, southern England, uh, especially in London. And his involvement in scrotting campaigns there. So the engagement by some anarchists in electoralism doesn't go uncriticised. There's been significant discussion on forums, in uh, news groups, on, in uh, 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 hard copy and virtual uh, newspapers uh, from, from anarchists uh, about this. But Floka from uh, the Edinburgh uh, Anarchist Federation argued that uh, engaging in parliamentarism, in electoralism, damages direct action, as it appears to support constitutional engagement. It seems to be suggesting, you know, can stand the right candidates, there's no need for you to participate in direct action, get somebody else to do it for you, uh, elect the right officer, and they'll do it for you. Not everyone will see what you're doing is as satav. Not everyone is going to get the joke. But they just see a class war candidate, even though you're offering all these critiques, and they don't see the critiques, they just see the candidate. They just see the candidacy. The second criticism, but the tactic itself, even if you're not trying to gain election, but merely participating in it, it creates hierarchies. Attention is centred on the candidates. You create a class of leaders in the public imagination. After all, they're the names on the ballot papers. They're the names on the posters. And it recreates the people as the national subject, the demos, who have to go out and vote for you. And it takes resources away from building prefigurative institutions. 
uh, to stand just nine candidates cost class war £4,500 before even a single ballot paper has been printed. If they tried to stand for 29, they wanted to originally, that would have been nearly, um, nearly uh, £15,000 before they printed a single uh, uh, election leaflet or poster. And they're giving that money to the state. Class War has a few hundred members, quite a lot of supporters, but only a few, not, maybe not even that. A lot of resources taken away to be dedicated. Better off doing, using those resources, your time and effort, on promoting direct action. Well, there's a number of replies to this. It's part of an ongoing debate. And one of it is just to accept, yeah, but Daimoy are diverse. There is no single way any phenomena is going to be interpreted. If you stand for election, some will interpret it, will get the joke, others won't. That's always a risk in whatever political, anti-political activity you're engaged with. People are going to interpret it in different ways. One way you can make it clearer that you weren't trying to be the new boss class, that you weren't trying to offer a better set of policies, uh, would be to make it uh, the, elect, uh, the representative abstentionist position. For if you vote for me, I will not take my seat. Now, that's the position Sinn Féin take in the UK Parliament. No Sinn Féin MP sits in Parliament, and they're elected on that basis. People vote for them. No, they're not going to take their seats. And he could do that more overtly. And I did raise that with John, and he said... You know, we just didn't imagine anyone would think that we were standing to be elected. Now, given our resources are clearly confrontational uh, publicity, surely no one uh, would seriously think that we're standing to be elected. So they never discussed this uh, as an option. Um, hierarchies, you do get hierarchies. But hierarchies appear even in direct action, as we discussed. The thing is, they're acceptable if they're provisional, limited, and under regular critique. But you don't stand the same people in the same position every time. And as anarchist constitutionalism is just part of a repertoire of uh, uh, pranks, uh, of um, practices of anti-political forms. There's no reason why you should see the people who stand for election more important than those people who, who uh, initiate direct action. And it's done to assist and promote direct action, not to replace it. And indeed, a lot of the literature involves uh, discussion and promotion of non-constitutional political actions. So, conclusion. My apologies, I went on a... <coughs> few minutes longer than I expected, my apologies. Um, much has been omitted in this paper and presentation. There's a few, quite a lot of things it doesn't explore. Uh, it doesn't explore whether the democratic criticisms of liberal democracy are right. They might be very flawed criticism, maybe uh, substantial answers to them. I'm not looking at whether they are right or wrong. I'm not looking at whether they're popular. I'm not looking at these are convincing arguments which are going to win popular approval. It's not the... Uh, uh, the aim of the paper, but it may be an area for discussion. What I was using those is highlighting their criticisms to see if they, how they applied to their own electoral activity, sort of self-critique. I explore differences between engaging and representative, nor do I explore uh, in this paper differences between engaging in representative democracy and engaging in direct democracy and referenda. Is there a difference between participating in referenda like the worker solidarity movement do in Ireland. There's been lots of referenda. They've engaged in all of them, whether on uh, abortion rights, on uh, the Lisbon Treaty, on divorce law. Uh, engaged in them, but they don't participate in representative elections. Why the difference? Is that important? Is there a significant difference? I don't, I, this paper itself doesn't explore that question. It does, however, explore anarchist constitutionalism uh, uh, as a minority tactic, but it's not unique or perverse to anarchism. It's important that it remains a minority tactic within anarchism, but it's not uni unique or perverse to anarchism. And I distinguish it from other uh, forms of guerrilla electoralism. And how it embodies or responds to its own criti criticisms of liberal democracy. 
non-electoral anarchists, more standard anarchists, have highlighted potential weaknesses in anarchist constitutionalism, and I've discussed some of the ways these might be overcome. And this may not be just useful for anarchists, but for researchers in citizenship and those involved in perhaps structural reformism uh, who look for parliamentary solutions. Thank you very much. <laughs>